Well, I was here because I had a few business meetings, but I tied them in with Anna's event because I wanted to come see her on stage and hear her talk about Milkman. I'm from North Belfast, which is where the book is largely set. And I think Anna, I can't say that it, it changed my feelings on it because I just, I read it and it, I've said this before, but it was as if she looked inside my head and just transplanted what was there. Because even though I grew up around that area in the 90s and she grew up there in the 70s, so much of what she described was so authentic and true to life, like the claustrophobic feeling, the, you know, the suspicions, the gossip, the rumours, everything, it was so true to life. And I think it just is great to hear tonight her talking about her process and so on. And the only thing that it really changed for me was it was really great to hear her reading um, from the books. When I, she started reading it, I could hear her slipping back into her Ardoin accent, <laughs> you know? And it's maybe if you're from Belfast, you maybe only pick that up if you're from the area, you know the accent. But certainly that gave it an extra sort of weight. Like I could just, it really brought it to life. And I knew, it, I felt like it was so real before. But when you hear it in that cadence and that vernacular. I'm Anna Burns and I'm going to read a little section from my friend Lyra McKee's book, Lost, Found, Remembered. Before I do, I'll say that I met Lyra in the spring of 2018 and then she was gone killed by 2019, so we weren't in each other's lives for long. I find in my life, though, that I meet with certain individuals now and then, and it's as if I've known them all along, as if I've known them always. Also, that I've loved them always. It was like that with Lyra. During the brief time I knew her, I found Lyra to be a wonderfully open individual. She possessed an innate belief in people and was sensitive and gentle with others. She also had a trillion megawatt light bulb of energy and friendliness coming out of her, which was great to be around. Even before I met any of her friends and family, I knew this woman was well loved. It was a delight for me every time I had the opportunity to meet with her. I thought I would have many, many meetings with her, which turned out not to be the case. Enormous as the loss is, I know really that it's not the length of time that matters between people. It's the quality of the connection that gets made. And I'm glad I got to have a true, authentic connection with dear Lyra. And now I'll read from a piece of Lyra's writing called Requiem for a Journalist. It was originally published in The Muckraker in June 2013. Requiem for a Journalist Yesterday I received an email from Lise Olson, an investigative reporter at the Houston Chronicle via the Global Investigative Journalism Network's listserv. In it, she implored the global community of investigative reporters to take action following news that one of our own was murdered in Mexico. An excerpt. So it is really important for us as a community of investigative reporters to react strongly to the news this week of an assassination of a young online editor in Mexico Jaime Guadalupe Gonzalez Dominguez, who lived minutes from America, and of yet another armed attack on El Sigli de Torreon, one of the most important and few remaining strong voices for press freedom in northeast Mexico, which has been devastated by violence. Every time I tweet news like this, I say, it could happen to any of us. Really, what I'm thinking is, it could happen to me, and I know others are thinking the same thing. I'm working on a story that requires me to ask questions about dangerous people. Every day I wonder if they're going to find out and do something about it. When I walk to the shop at night, I keep one eye on the road in case a car slows down. Parked cars make me nervous, as do men in hoodies. I rehearse the moment in my head, escaping as bullets whiz past, hiding behind a hedge and firing back with an imaginary gun that I don't own. 
I know that if it happens, it won't go down like that. It'll happen quickly and I will either live or die. In reality, my fears are probably groundless, so I tell myself. I know these people have killed before. I pray that they won't kill a journalist, that doing so would raise too many questions, that they're smarter than that. Yet if they did, how would my community react? What would they do about it? Would they tweet, so sad, could happen to any of us? Or would they actually do something? My name is Sinead Gleeson and I first got to know Lyra McKee, like a lot of people, from Twitter. Um, we interacted a lot, we talked a lot and messaged a lot. And I was hugely admiring of her journalism and how vocal she was on so many subjects. Um, in 2017, I curated a panel in Downpatrick and I asked Lyra to be a guest. It was on the subject of the internet, internet culture, um, silencing, speaking up, all of those kind of questions. And she just blew me away with her fearlessness and her drive and her eloquence. And Lyra spoke up not just for herself and her community, but for more marginalised and and you know, people whose voices were not always heard in these important political conversations. And I think, you know, I'm so glad I got to meet her then. And we, we kept in touch right up until the month that she died. Her loss is, is immense. And I hope in the future that, you know, reading this book, the words are still so resonant, particularly what's going on in Northern Ireland at the moment. And I hope that people take comfort in her, her work and her words. And I hope that for Lyra and for her family, that her killer is found and there is justice for the wonderful and much missed Lyra McKee. I'm going to read something from her, her book uh, in her own words. And this is from a chapter called Bigger Issues Than Tribalism Being Ignored and No One Seems to Care. A childhood spent growing up near an interface had taught me to loathe any form of tribal allegiance. Republicanism and unionism loyalism were, for me, inevitably intertwined with conflict, hatred, and an aversion to progress. Yet the reality is that neither unionism, loyalism, or republicanism is inherently bad. The problem is how they're interpreted or applied. The old line about a Bible in one man's hand being as bad as a whiskey bottle in another's springs to mind. To say that Catholics and Protestants sticking with their traditional constitutional positions indicates a lack of civic progress is to ignore how their political beliefs are rooted in culture and community. Being a Republican nationalist is about more than wanting a united Ireland as it is being a unionist or loyalist. Each comes with its own set of traditions, cultures, ties, even language and dialect. And to expect people to abandon that in the name of progress is both short-sighted and an impossible bar by which to measure progress against. Worse, it plays into a broader, unhelpful narrative that pits unionists and nationalists against each other. It suggests that as long as people subscribe to either, the peace process is a failure because the two cannot peacefully coexist. It's this assumption that our politicians and our country seems to operate on, that the conflict hasn't ended and there's still an enemy that needs to be defeated. And they're living on the other side of the peace wall. Yet that's not true. And as long as we believe it is, we're setting the bar pretty low for how we expect our public representatives to behave. The peace process will not be a failure because we did not abandon our political beliefs or cultures. It will be a failure because we did not learn that each other's existence is not something to be objected to. A united Ireland will not happen without a sizable chunk of the unionist population consenting. Nor will the sky fall in because someone gives a second preference to the party he wants to govern alongside. My fears for Northern Ireland don't lie in tribal differences, but in bigger problems that get lost in the never ending debate about identity. Our spiraling suicide rate, young people who think dying is an option, but a life lived in Northern Ireland isn't. Our abysmal lack of mental health facilities, 
a job creation strategy that focuses on creating minimum wage call centre roles that crush the souls of our youth and sends them scurrying for other shores. The peace process may have delivered peace and nothing else for my generation. We're still dying, even though the conflict is over and no one seems to care. Many people have grown to dislike the use of the word war to describe what happened here. The term, the conflict, became a more acceptable alternative, even if it made a 30-year battle sound like a lover's tiff. It's got the ring of a euphemism, the kind one might use to refer to a shameful family secret during a reunion lunch. Part of the argument was that the victims felt calling it war gave legitimacy to terrorist groups and their volunteers, allowed them to view themselves as soldiers, either in the cause of saving Ireland from British rule or of saving it from those who wanted to save it from British rule. But we were to be the generation to avoid all that. We were to reap the spoils and prosperity that supposedly came with peace. In the end, we did get the peace, or something close to it. And those who'd caused carnage in the decades before got the money. Whether they'd abandoned arms, as the provisionals did, or retained them, like the loyalists, they'd managed to make a ton of paper. We got to live with the outcome of their choices. But before I tell you about how my generation got fucked over, I should probably talk a little about how the war started in the first place. You probably know this story or parts of it, but let me tell it to you in my own words because the answer to the question depends on who you ask and how far back you want to go. And so my own take matters. Hello, I'm Gail Walker, and I was editor of the Belfast Telegraph during the period when Lyra was murdered. This was the murder of a hugely talented young journalist who'd been contributing to the newspaper for five years. It was also the death of a personal friend, and I'm very honoured to be asked to contribute to this celebration of Lyra's life and work. Recent rioting in Belfast has highlighted once again what was lost when Lyra was killed. The extract I'm going to read shows just how nuanced her perspectives were on the so-called peace. From the constitutional question is holding us back. Growing up on an interface during a conflict, even one that's fading, means your childhood was not normal. North Belfast was a difficult place to be during the 90s. Knowing where to go and where not to go was a matter of life and death. At eight years old, I knew that venturing too far down Manor Street was a risk. One of the surviving Shankill butchers was rumoured to live there. Three streets up was Rossapenna Street, where loyalists would drive from a nearby road that connected the old park to the Shankill. I was banned from going there after my mum saw a young father murdered. I lived with the same fears as the other kids. We knew there were certain adults in the street we were to never talk back to. If our football landed in their garden, we ran. I remember one individual in particular who frightened children and adults alike. We were warned to not upset him because... People who argue with him go missing. As I'm typing this, I wonder if my mind has invented it all. I know it hasn't. I'm 24 next month. In 16 years, Northern Ireland has come so far. The contrast between 2014 and 1998 is so stark that the old days don't feel real. I'm from a mixed religion family but was baptised Catholic and grew up in a Republican area. I'm the kind of voter Sinn Féin might target, yet I won't vote for them or for the SDLP. While they bicker with unionists and worry about a united Ireland, 
I'm worried about paying this month's bills. The Good Friday Agreement has created a new generation of young people, free from the cultural constraints and prejudices of the one before. It used to be that being a unionist or nationalist was an accident of birth. You didn't decide whether you were for the union or not. The decision was made for you. Your friends were drawn from your own kind. Looking at my own social circle, it's clear how times have changed. One of my oldest friends is a DUP voting orange man who marches every 12th of July. Another friend is a former loyalist paramilitary who has tried to make a new life for himself. Another is a former provisional IRA member who has done the same. Rounding this motley group off is my friend Declan, not his real name, a policeman from a staunchly Republican family. Just 15 years ago, it would have been unthinkable for someone like me to have such an eclectic friendship group. It would have been unthinkable for someone like Declan to join the police. Whilst our politicians debate issues connected to the past, we have moved on. Whilst I saw the tail end of the conflict, I didn't see enough to make me bitter towards the other side. I saw enough that peace and moving forward seemed like the only options. Most children of the GFA generation, those born after 1998 or who were relatively young when the agreement was signed, saw no conflict at all. Slowly, a common consensus is emerging. The belief that the Union versus a United Ireland argument should be left to die. It's holding us back. It reminds us of days past. I don't want a United Ireland or a stronger Union. I just want a better life. Thank you. I'm Lucy Caldwell, and it's a privilege to read Lyra McKee's A Letter to My 14-Year-Old Self. Kid, it's going to be okay. I know you're not feeling that way right now. You're sitting in school. The other kids are making fun of you. You told the wrong person you had a crush, and soon they all knew your secret. It's horrible. They make your life hell. They laugh at you, whisper about you, call you names. It's not nice. And you can't ask an adult for help because if you did that, you'd have to tell them the truth. And you can't do that. They can't ever know your secret. Life is so hard right now. Every day you wake up wondering who else will find out your secret and hate you. It won't always be like this. It's going to get better. In a year's time, you're going to join a scheme that trains people your age to be journalists. I know the careers teacher suggested that as an option and you said no because it sounded boring and all you wanted to do was write. But go with it. For the first time in your life, you will feel like you're good at something useful. You'll have found your calling. You'll meet amazing people. And when the bad times come again, FYI, your first girlfriend is not the one. Oh, and you will screw up that history exam. It will be journalism that helps you soldier on. In two years time, you'll leave school and go to a local technical college. Don't worry, you're going to make friends. These will be your first real friends in semi-adulthood, the people who will answer your calls at four o'clock in the morning. In the years to come, you'll only keep in touch with Gavin and Johnny, but you'll remember the others fondly. When you're 17, you'll tell them your secret and they won't mind. It will take courage, but you'll do it. Gavin will become Christian and you will fear that he will hate you. But one morning, you'll receive a text message saying, this changes nothing. You'll always be my friend. Accept him for what he is, as he has accepted you. You'll go to university like you always planned to, but you'll drop out because it reminds you of school where people were cold and you had few friends. The campus is just too big and scary. But this experience will be the making of you. You'll be making your way in the world for the first time. Through this, you will meet the people who become your best friends. They'll help you replace all the bad memories with good ones. For the first time in your life, you will like yourself. 
three months before your 21st birthday, you'll tell mum the secret. You will be sobbing and shaking and she'll be frightened because she doesn't know what's wrong. Christmas will be just a couple of weeks away. You have to tell her because you've met someone you like and you can't live with the guilt anymore. You can't get the words out, so she says it. Are you gay? And you will say, yes, mommy, I'm so sorry. And instead of getting mad, she will reply, thank God you're not pregnant. You will crawl into her lap, sobbing, as she holds you and tells you, you're her little girl. How did you ever think that anything could make her love you any less? You will feel like a prisoner who's just been given their freedom. You will remember all the times you pleaded with God to help you because you were so afraid. And you will feel so foolish because you had nothing to worry about. You'll tell your siblings, no one will mind. Mary will hug you in the food court at Castle Court as you eat KFC together and she'll tell you she's so proud of you. The others will joke about how they always knew. They'll all say some variation of, I love you, I'm so proud of you, this doesn't change a thing. You will feel so lucky. You watch James get thrown out of his house after coming out to his parents. You were in Michael's house tonight, his mum said she would beat the gay out of him. You will feel guilty for being the lucky one and getting it easy in the end, even though you went through hell to get there. You will fall in love for the first time. You will have your heart broken for the first time and you will feel like you might die of the pain. You won't, you will get over it. Right now, you're wondering if you'll ever be normal. You are normal, there is nothing wrong with you. You are not going to hell. You did nothing to deserve their hate. Life will not only get easier, it will get so much better. You will walk down the street without fear. Teenage boys you've never met will not throw things at you and shout names. Your friends will be the best anyone could ever ask for. You'll be invited to parties. You'll have a social life. You will be loved. People will use words like awesome and cool and witty to describe you. And you'll forget the other times the other kids said you were weird, odd, a lesbo. You will do normal things. You'll spend time with your mum. You'll go to work and pay your bills. You'll go to the cinema with your best friend every week because that's your ritual. Dinner, then an action movie where things explode. You will fall in love again. You will smile every day, knowing that someone loves you as much as you love them. Keep hanging on, kid. It's worth it. I love you. I'm Colette Bryce, a writer from Derry. And I'm going to read an extract from this terrific collection of journalism by Lyra McKee, Lost, Found, Remembered. And the piece I've chosen uh, is the last part of an article about intergenerational trauma uh, as applied to Northern Ireland and the young people living there. It's called Suicide of the Ceasefire Babies. The Sunflower is a tiny little pub perched on a corner in the alleyways that sit between the edge of North Belfast and the city centre. With bright green paintwork, it's known for attracting a genteel crowd of writers, journalists, poets and musicians. A smattering of post-conflict hipsters who wear tight jeans and tweed jackets and converse. There are poetry readings and concerts by local indie bands in a smallish room upstairs. A sign outside on the wall says no topless sunbathing. Ulster has suffered enough. For tourists, it's an introduction to the natives' quirky black humour, our way of dealing with all that's happened. It was there that I went one Thursday afternoon to meet Johnny. We never figured out why Johnny's stepdad told Big Gay Mick that Johnny was dead. We found out within a day that he was still alive. Now he was sitting in front of me, toned and muscular, with his dark hair swept over his eyes, the glasses replaced by contact lenses. Well, I'd never really shaken off the unkempt, geeky look. He looked like he could have been an extra in a Baywatch beach scene. We'd all grown up together. Me, him, big gay Mick, Tanya, little Jimmy. But there was so much he'd kept hidden from us. He'd had depression for a while. 
All I understand and it was all I understand it being was sheer despair, he said. It was a despair that you couldn't lift. It stayed with you all day when you slept, when you woke up, when you felt the same way and you felt the same way and you went to sleep if you did sleep. It's just constant. I call it the black dog. It's a constant sort of feeling hanging over you of just pure emptiness, hopelessness. After a second suicide attempt, he was taken to a mental health facility. Several more attempts followed. I was always very opportunistic. It was never planned out, he says. If I saw an opportunity, I took it. So it was quite impulsive. It was quite frightening. I think I was under observation for a while. Since then, though, his life has changed. With the help of medication to help him stabilise, he has his own flat and he's gone back to school. He still sings. Next year, he plans to try out for a televised singing competition. I was grateful to be there in that weird hipster bar, drinking with Johnny instead of visiting his grave. Then I thought of all those who should have been sat there with us, friends and acquaintances who never made it into adulthood. We could have filled the sunflower with them and still had people spilling out onto the streets. The problem hasn't gone away. Those who survived the troubles called us the ceasefire babies, as if resentful that we'd grown up unaccustomed to the sound of gunfire, assuming that we didn't have dead to mourn like they did. Yet we did. Sometimes I count their names on my fingers, quickly running out of digits. Friends, friends of friends, neighbours, relatives, the kids whose face, faces I knew but whose names I learned only from the obituary columns. The tragic irony of life in Northern Ireland today is that peace seems to have claimed more lives than war ever did. Lost, found, remembered. Lyra McKee. Hello, my name is Martin Doyle. I'm books editor of the Irish Times newspaper in Dublin. I didn't know Lyra McKee personally, but I was a huge admirer of her writing and her journalism. In fact, a month before her murder, I included Lyra in a piece entitled Best of Irish, 10 Rising Stars of Irish Writing. As my tribute to Lyra, I'm going to read the article that I published just a few hours after waking up to learn the terrible news of her murder on April the 19th, 2019. The past is never past, wrote William Faulkner. It is not even past. The senseless shooting dead of journalist and author Lyra McKee by dissident Republicans in Derry last night feels like the worst of our past reaching out its cold, dead hand to rob us of the best of our future. We were the Good Friday Agreement generation, destined to never witness the horrors of war, but to reap the spoils of peace. The spoils just never seemed to reach us. McKee was writing here in a typically empathetic essay about the toll the legacy of the Troubles took on the young in the form of suicide. McKee, already an acclaimed journalist, looked set to reap the spoils of peace with the publication by Faber and Faber next year of her much anticipated book, The Lost Boys. There is a risk that it too may be lost as the book is unfinished, possibly compounding our loss. Only last month I featured her in an article, Best of Irish, 10 Rising Stars of Irish Writing. North Belfast, I wrote, once the cockpit of the troubles is suddenly a hotbed of fiction, thanks to Man Booker winner Milkman by Ardoin's Anna Burns, flanked by Paul McVeigh's The Good Son and David Keenan's For the Good Times. Next up is Lyra McKee, a 28-year-old journalist whose debut, The Lost Boys, will be published by Faber next year. The Lost Boys will explore the disappearances of a number of children and young men during the Troubles. Many of them were not believed to be victims of the IRA or the UVF. Some were kids who left home for school and never came home, and their disappearances were never solved by the police. McKee will investigate what happened to them. Angels with Blue Faces, a non-fiction novella about the murder in 1981 of Reverend Robert Bradford, the Ulster Unionist MP for South Belfast, 
is due to be published shortly by Excalibur Press. It's only last week that she approved the cover. We're only a week or so away from releasing it, publisher Tina Calder said. The book has been fully written and edited. Laura Hassan, her editor at Faber and Faber said, as a writer, Lyra was drawn to subjects usually met with silence. She wrote about growing up gay in Northern Ireland, the epidemic of suicide among her generation in Belfast. And in her forthcoming book, she was investigating the unsolved disappearances of children during the Troubles. She could always see the imprint of the Troubles in the graves freshly dug for those too young to fully remember the conflict. And it is just heartbreaking that a continuation of that violence has cut short her life too. Lyra asked the right questions and reported on the things that matter. I will miss her candour, her humour, her determined curiosity and her warmth. Belfast has lost a distinct writing talent and a lovely young woman. Will Francis, her agent, said, Lyra McKee was gifted, brave, kind and funny. I'm proud to have been her literary agent. I started working with her after Chrissy Giles at Mosaic published Lyra's extraordinary piece about the effect of the war in Northern Ireland on her generation, growing up in Belfast after the Good Friday Agreement. She wrote about the legacy of the Troubles, about a city haunted by its recent past, and did so with tremendous wit and insight. I sold her book, The Lost Boys, about the disappearance of children in Belfast in the 1970s to Faber last year on the basis of a short proposal. In that document, she wrote about growing up in a conflict hotspot in North Belfast, off the road known as the Murder Mile. She wrote, many people have grown to dislike the use of the word war to describe what happened here. The term the conflict became a more acceptable alternative, even if it made a 30 year battle sound like a lover's tiff. It's got the ring of a euphemism, the kind one might use to refer to a shameful family secret during a reunion lunch. I witnessed its last years, as armed campaigns died and gave way to an uneasy tension we natives of Northern Ireland have named peace. And I lived with its legacy, watching friends and family members cope with the trauma of what they could not forget. As William Faulkner wrote, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. We've lost a tremendous talent, and today I'm remembering Lyra and thinking of her friends, her partner and her family. It is easy in retrospect to recognise the writer and author Lyra McKee would become in a 2008 article in the Irish Times about an educational trip by Northern Ireland pupils to Auschwitz. While some students struggled to relate, McKee empathised. Down in the gas chamber, I saw this square of light in the ceiling, she recalls. It was such a sunny day and in there it was so dark and it was nearly like I was in the mindset of one of the Jews 60 years ago because the first thing I thought was I'm never going to see the daylight again. The year before she had spoken about her passion for journalism in a feature by Fanula Meredith on Headliners, a news agency run by young people in Belfast. In her diary for the BBC Blast website, 17-year-old Lyra McKee from Belfast was refreshingly frank about the challenges of the job. The strain of the past 11 days plunged me into a zombie-like stupor. Even with all this, I can still honestly say, wait till I cross my fingers, that I love being a journalist. Turning out a great piece of work, even when time is running against you, is like sticking your tongue out and saying, ha ha, look what I can do. Lyra a confident, articulate girl who says she was never a straight-A student, last year won Sky's Young Journalist competition. I always dreamt of winning an award for journalism. It's the sort of thing that normally only happens to grammar school girls. Lyra says the agency has changed her prospects. Headliners offered me a clean slate, a chance to prove myself, to show I had a talent I could be proud of. The stereotype formula where I come from is that you leave school, then work in a shop. But now I'm going on to do my A-levels. In 2015, her career took a new turn when her blog post went viral, a letter to her 14-year-old self who had struggled with the fact of being gay in a hostile environment. 
Friends made it into a short film. To paraphrase L.P. Hartley, for violent extremists of whatever shade, bitter orange or bile green, the past is not a foreign country. It is the only country they know and love, and they are seemingly incapable of doing things differently, i.e. living and letting live in peace. All we can do as a society is protect ourselves from them and provide a better example. Lyra McKee represented the future. Another country, a better one. Thanks. Okay, so I knew um, Lyra, her metal, well, as I explained the letter, but um, it was through Twitter, um, now disqualified as a journalist and had moved back from Sheffield to Belfast um, and got to know Lyra then. So this letter was produced during uh, Dear Sister, which was a collaborative project between English, should I say English Pen or English PEN, <laughs> and Off the Shelf Festival of Words. So I, I will read, read the letter to Lyra now. Dear Lyra, it's happiness that is, that's the worst. This is new. It is when I am the happiest that I ache for you the most. I long to hear your laugh, to gossip with you over a hot chocolate in the Clements in Belfast city centre. Your auntie Lyra looks after you. I long to meet you again in London, both stressed and happy. Finally, your career is coming together. You have signed books to Faber and Faber. None of us like studying English at Queen's much. We find the lectures largely snobby and dull. We are impatient always, impatient to get to the heart, to the truth of a story. Our mind is not suited to long drawn out academic study. I endured and you quit. You always seemed braver. You helped me become braver. I wouldn't still be writing if it weren't for you. I almost failed my postgraduate degree in journalism. I was incredibly homesick after the high of getting a fancy scholarship and moving to England. Life became such a struggle. I was getting poor marks. I lived in a house that didn't feel safe. I felt my Irishness in full for the first time. I felt my difference. My first boyfriend that lasted three months. I do not belong. I cannot be right in the ways which matter. I don't remember how exactly we connected. It must have been via Twitter. But I remember vividly the first day we met. I was working part-time in a call centre. And part-time in Sierra our gig at Windsor Stadium. I was living off about £800 a month. I was trying to keep writing to freelance, but I wanted to quit. My confidence had been shattered by my year in England. You were adamant that I would do no such thing. Kylie, you have something special. The Guardian seen it. They give you a scholarship. You don't get that for nothing. You just need to find your own path. I had done some shifts at the Belfast Telegraph, but suddenly was dropped. I had an interview to be a reporter for a newspaper in a town any unionist town. I didn't get the job. Writing about abortion and gay rights probably didn't help. I listened to you and started to aim higher. The Guardian opinion column I got published while still working at the call centre. I'm moving to London to work in marketing for a charity a month after. Lyra, you did not let me settle, did not let me waste my talent. You showed me that I could be brilliant even if I didn't fit the typical mould of a journalist. I still have the scarf you described as Harry Potter. I bought on Black Friday 2017 in H&M. Um, I thought the yellow and red, beautiful autumnal colours. I was horrified when excitement you exclaimed, oh, you like Harry Potter too. <laughs> the colours of Gryffindor. I had liked Harry Potter as a child, and I was secretly proud that the sorting hat had placed me in Gryffindor. Brave and foolish, that captures my life. Perhaps if you were still alive, I would have given the scarf to a charity shop. I might have given it to my niece to wrap a doll or teddy in. I might have given it to my dad to wrap a little lamb in. As things are, and it's taken me some time to accept this, you are not alive. So I still wear my Harry Potter scarf, my bobbled and worn. I smile every winter when I drape its familiar warmth around my neck. It is my best link to my memories of you. In a few weeks, I will go on a date with a woman. You are one of the first few people I came out to. Then I thought it was by. now I know that I'm gay. What would you make of this? I know we would have a, had a lot to laugh about. I've been messaging this woman for several months and I really like her. I will wear my Harry Potter scarf and remember my Aries lesbian brave journalist friend. These are all true for me too. And although I cannot understand it, wish it weren't so, I will live my life as fully and bravely as you did, as you taught me to.